Good evening. This is the second of three talks that I'm giving, and I have a title for them now. I'm calling them Natural Disasters, A Bible Perspective. And you can understand why I've chosen this subject. Three weeks ago, we had the worst natural disaster in my lifetime. The death toll is already climbing to nearly quarter of a million and whole towns and cities have been destroyed by the tsunami. That's a word you probably didn't know before three weeks ago. It's a Japanese word for tidal wave. Now, let me recap from last week. We talked about all the needs that are surfacing after such a disaster. And I mentioned there were three types of need which we need to meet. First, there are the physical needs the physical needs of the dead. They need to be found, identified, and buried. But it's mainly the needs of the survivors that we're thinking about. They need food and water and medicine and shelter and a whole lot of other things. And worldwide support and sympathy is providing a lot. But after the physical needs are met, there are then emotional needs, and we mentioned three last time. There is, first of all, the need to deal with shock, trauma. Counselors are needed. And then the need switches to grief, sorrow, bereavement, especially when loved ones don't know what happened to their own. And then we move on to intellectual needs after shock, grief, and then anger. Anger is a real emotional need after a, a disaster like this. People are angry at what has happened and they want to find a scapegoat, somebody they can blame. And if they can't find anybody human, they think God would make a good scapegoat. And that brings me to the third need, intellectual needs. Our minds need to grapple with it. We ask questions about it. The first question we ask is, how? How did it happen? What caused it? If we can understand what caused it, maybe we can avoid it or even prevent it. And so science has to give the answer to the question, how? But there's a much bigger question that I'm dealing with, and that is the question, why? And science can't tell us why. Science can tell us how the universe began, how we came to be here, but it can't tell us why the universe is here and why we're here. We're into the realm of philosophy and religion when we ask why do these things happen. Now, we need an answer to the question why that satisfies two parts of us, that satisfies our mind and that satisfies our conscience. You see, the mind needs a rational answer to why these things happen, but the conscience needs a moral answer. In other words, we not only need a reason, but we need a good reason if we're going to find a satisfactory answer. For example, supposing I told you that God had built into nature a mechanism that keeps the world population down and helps us to provide enough food for those who are left. That such things as tsunamis are deliberately there to reduce the population and keep it within manageable proportions. Now, that's a rational answer. It's a reason, but something in us rebels. It's not a good reason. It's not a moral reason. Actually, a clergyman more than 200 years ago called Malthus he wrote a book about this and said that poverty and disease and wars are all designed to keep the population explosion from becoming too great. I don't agree with that. It may satisfy reason, but it doesn't satisfy conscience. We need a reason and a good reason. Now, last time I defined the problem very carefully. I said that you only have a problem about natural disasters if you've already accepted three assumptions. The first is that there is only one God. If there are many gods or if there's no God at all, there's no problem. But if you believe there's only one God in the universe, then you have a problem. The second assumption is that he is all-powerful and that he can control what he's created, that he's in charge of nature. 
And the third assumption you need to make before you have a problem is that God is all loving. So it is only those who accept that there is one God and that he's all powerful and that he's all loving that we really have the problem of why these things happen. Now, last week I did mention three answers which I'm afraid Christians are giving, church answers which are less than satisfactory. The first I mentioned was that suffering is a complete mystery. No one understands why. God hasn't told us. The only thing you can do in the face of such disasters is to say it is God's will and we must submit to that. We shall only get ourselves into a, a panic if we try to find out why. That suffering is a mystery. We don't understand it. Maybe we will one day, but we don't know. That's not a satisfactory answer. It leaves the mind and the conscience searching for more answers. The second wrong answer I mentioned was that such disasters produce a lot of good, a lot of goodwill. Think of all the selfishness and greed of a world that suddenly it becomes unselfish and becomes caring for other people. What good will has resulted from this disaster? But that doesn't justify the bad event that caused the goodwill. Indeed, if you think that way, you, you come to the conclusion that we humans are a good deal better than God. He caused it and we become good at helping each other after it. And not a few people think that uh, we're better than God and we could manage the world a good deal better than he does if we were in charge. So that's not a very satisfactory answer. A lot of good has come out of the disaster, but that doesn't justify it. And the third wrong answer I gave was an extraordinary one that God himself is too weak to stop such things happening. And all he can offer us is solidarity and support and stand with us, offering his sympathy. But he's as much a victim of natural disasters as we are. Extraordinary that Christian leaders should uh, teach such an extraordinary thing that God is weak. Because, well, everybody knows that God is almighty. It's one of the most common expletives we use, God almighty. And we don't always realize what truth there is in that. Just as we also have another expletive, good God. But both these terms simply now are meaningless. They express surprise, astonishment, or God Almighty, or good God. And that's all they mean. But in fact, both are true. And it's because God is almighty and good that we have this problem. Why? Why does he allow it? Why does he cause it? Why doesn't he stop it? Well, now, I'm going to turn to the Bible now. I didn't do much of that last week. But you see, I'm a Christian, and this is my authority. I believe it to be the Word of God. And I believe it gives the best explanation of things of any scriptures or any religion. I find it gives the best explanation of our universe, how it came to be, and how it will end. It gives the best explanation of why I'm here and why you're here. Gives the best explanation about the future. And above all, it has quite a lot to say about natural disasters. And so I'm turning to the Bible. I'm so glad it's a book about facts. It's uh, about God, a living God who is living in our universe. You know, there was a movement some years ago that God is dead. But people who believed that didn't, weren't saying that he'd ceased to exist. They were saying he's no longer around. He may be alive in some other universe, but he's not alive in our world now. He used to be, but he's not now. But in fact, the Bible tells us that God is active here and now in our little world of time and space. That's why there's so much history in the Bible and so much geography. It's about real people in real time and in real space. Places in the Bible we can still go and see today. It's a book of reality. And in fact, it claims to tell us what God has said and done in our world. That's what we mean by a living God. Someone who's as active and speaking as we are in this world. 
it's a record of his words and deeds, his miracles and his message to us. And so we have here a book in which we can get to know God, and it actually claims to tell us about the only true God. Interestingly enough, in Hebrew and Greek, the two languages in which this book was written, the word true is the same as our word real, because what is real is true, and what is true is real. And so it's claiming to tell us about the only real God, the only one who really exists. And it tells us what he's really like. And that's my subject for, night, for tonight. What is God really like? I'm going to begin with what the Bible says about nature. It doesn't say anything about tsunamis, but then it's about what happened on land, not what about happened in the oceans, with one possible exception, which I'll mention later. But it does talk about the cause of tsunamis. It has a lot to say about earthquakes. Many earthquakes within the historical record covered by this book. And that's largely because most of this book is written about events in an earthquake zone. The biggest crack in the Earth's crust stretches all the way from Syria right down through the land of Israel, right down through what's called the Aravah to the Red Sea, right down the Gulf of Aqaba, across into Ethiopia and splits Ethiopia in two, down into Uganda and Kenya where it splits into two and then it joins up again and finishes in Mozambique. Now that's the biggest crust, actually the biggest crack in the Earth's crust, but actually it's two cracks and the land between the two cracks has sunk, and that's what creates the Great Rift Valley, as we call it, and it's constantly subject to earth tremors and major earthquakes. So it's not surprising that the Bible is full of earthquakes. It's right in the worst place for the earth being shaken. Now, some of the earthquakes mentioned are simply natural events. But a number of them are called supernatural events because they've been directly caused by God. And that raises the whole question of what is the relationship between God and nature? Does he control everything that goes on in nature, every little breath of wind, every snowflake that falls? Does he switch everything on and off? Not quite. The Bible seems to suggest that the relationship between God and nature is more like that between a headmaster and the school timetable. At the beginning of term, the headmaster may map out the school timetable and say that every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock it'll be history. But then being headmaster, he has the power and the authority to step in on any day and change the timetable and make it do something else. So he can step in on any Tuesday and say, it won't be history at 10 o'clock, it'll be geography. Now that, roughly speaking, is how the Bible pictures the relationship between God. He has made a timetable for nature and on the whole leaves nature to go along uh, that timetable or what we call the laws of nature. But he has the power and authority to step in at any moment and change that. That's what we call miracles because he's got the power and the authority to change what happens. Now, that's why we say some of the earthquakes and tremors in the Middle East are due to God stepping in. They are supernaturally controlled rather than simply nature controlled. And they are always linked with some crucial or significant event in the history of God's chosen people. For example, we have uh, an earthquake destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a natural, but also a supernatural event. It was God acting in anger and destroying not just two cities, but actually four cities destroyed in that earthquake. Then we have another earthquake when 
God appeared to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments. This was a crucial moment. And the people of God were camping at the foot of the mountain and were told, don't come anywhere near. This is holy ground. Moses, you can come and talk with me, but don't let the people near. And one of the things that kept them away was an earthquake that shook the mountain, as well as fire and smoke, which seems to indicate a volcanic eruption of some kind. And this was God's power being demonstrated. This was God being God. And the fear of God came upon the people. Then we move on, we find other earthquakes. We find one during the days of Saul, King Saul, one during the prophet Elijah. I've got a number written down here. The biggest one was during the reign of a king called Uzziah, and that was big, the most severe earthquake in the Old Testament days. And the prophet Isaiah, no, sorry, the prophet Amos, saw this clearly as God's judgment on the people. They were misbehaving very badly, and it was God making them pay for it, reminding them of how they were meant to live. It's interesting that centuries later, one of the other prophets, Zephaniah, still talked about that big earthquake in the days of Isaiah, centuries previously. That was a big one. When we come to the life of Jesus, we find that the whole universe seemed to be affected by the life of Jesus. When he was born, there was a star in the sky marking his birth. People have said to me, isn't that astrology? Doesn't that support astrology? I say no. Astrology believes that the position of stars at a baby's birth affects the baby's character. But in Bethlehem, it was the position of the baby that was affecting the stars. That's very different. But when Jesus died, the earth shook. Or we can say God shook the earth. The cross was put in a socket in the rock, and at a, at a certain point, the rock shook and shook the cross. And it was that that made a Roman army officer who was present say, Truly, this must have been the Son of God because he recognized God reacting to his Son's crucifixion by shaking the rock in which the cross stood. Three days and three nights later, the most amazing event happened, which has never happened before or since to another human being. Jesus came back to life with a new body. And again, it says there was an earthquake that marked that event. God was marking the event in nature to emphasize its importance. As we turn the pages of the New Testament, we find Paul and Silas in prison, and they are singing hymns at midnight. They are still praising God, even though they're in a, a pitch black dungeon chained behind locked doors, they're praising God. And how did God respond to their praise? He shook the city, and, and the doors of the prison burst open, and Paul and Silas and other prisoners could just walk out. That led to the conversion of the jailer. He'd never seen anything like it. He was in utter shock over the whole thing, but at least it opened his heart to think about God. We're going to see next time I talk to you that the Bible ends by predicting an increasing number and strength of earthquakes. And finishing, the end of this age will finish with the biggest earthquake there has ever been, which will shake every part of the earth. But I'll come to that next week when we talk about what God, the Bible says about the future. Let's get back to our subject for tonight. The Bible then attributes some of the earthquakes that happened in those days to God's direct in intervention to demonstrate his power or express his anger or simply to mark his presence with them, that the God who made it all is now here with his people. A display then of his anger or his power or whatever. We call this theism, when God controls what he has created. 
So some may be called natural and others may be called supernatural, what the insurance agents call an act of God. Now, we need to ask some very honest questions at this point. Let's state the problem again. If God is almighty, all-powerful, and all-loving, and the only God, then frankly, we've got a big problem. Why then does he cause or even just allow such natural disasters which take a terrible toll of life and cause unlimited damage? Why? Well, we've already seen that we must accept that God is all-powerful according to the Bible. He could start, start such things and he could stop them. So then why does he do it? Well, we must then turn to the other assumption that God is all-loving. And we must seriously question that. I know that for a hundred years the church has been focusing on God's love in public preaching. The message we've given to the world is God is love and God loves you. I'm going to show you that I believe that's been a terrible mistake, that we shouldn't have been doing that. I want to apologize for all the preachers who've told you God is love and God loves you. Now that may be a shocking statement to some of you, but let me back it up. When we turn to the Bible, and ask what is God really like, we find some rather surprising facts, and I want to give them to you. They will really make you think, and I don't apologize for that. We're to love God with all our minds, as well as all our hearts and strength, and the greatest unexplored territory in the world is between your ears. Very few of us are using the brains God gave us to their full capacity and finding out the truth. Well, now, what is the truth about God? For a hundred years, as I've said, Christian preachers have been preaching the love of God. And I want to ask, how has that message been heard? How has it been received? What has it conveyed to the people who heard it? And my answer in simple terms is, it has led to a sentimental view of God rather than a scriptural view. It's led people to construct their own image of God in their imagination rather than accept the image of God that is in Scripture. Let me tell you what I mean. When we say God is loving, how does the world receive that message? I'll tell you. They receive it that God is so loving that he would never, ever cause pain or suffering to anyone. Wouldn't hurt a fly that God loves us so much that he is there to protect us from all pain and suffering and to provide for all our needs, that in a word, he is there to make us happy. And of course, to be really happy, you need two other things, health and wealth. So it is assumed that God is there to save us from disease and poverty and that he should not allow anything to come near us that causes us pain, but that he should concentrate on giving us those things that give us pleasure. So God is there to keep pain away from me and to give pleasure to me. This is the concept that talking about a loving God seems to leave in many people's minds. He is there to serve us in this way. And frankly, if he doesn't do that, we fire him, we give him the sack. We say, I've called it quits with God. Do you know, I've, I've met so many people who talked like that. They said, I would believe in God if he hadn't allowed this to happen to me or to my family or to my relatives or to my friends or to whoever. And so they call it quits with God. They say, if God doesn't keep pain and suffering away from me, and give me pleasure and comfort and safety, then I'm finished with God. Now that's what generally I find people think when I say God is a loving God. So I've stopped saying it because that is not the Bible picture of God at all. In fact, it's a long way from the Bible picture of God. 
in the Bible, he does cause pain and suffering. He doesn't just give us comfort and safety and pleasure. Well, now I need to say a bit more about that, don't I? Let me give you an illustration, a very poignant one. Right at this moment, we are remembering the Holocaust in Germany. There are many television programs about it, and um, our prime minister has called for a, an annual day of remembrance, to remember six million Jews who suffered in the Holocaust. Now, I know Jews who come out of that suffering and said, I can't believe in a good God after that. I can't believe in a loving God. I, I can't believe in God. And many, I'm afraid, who escaped physically were damaged spiritually and were left as atheists and agnostics. They called it quits with God. God didn't protect them. He subjected them or allowed them to be subject to incredible horrors and pain and suffering. And so they said, well, I can't believe in God even. Never mind a loving God after all that. Well, in a lesser way, I meet many people who've said the same thing. Why did God allow cancer to take my loved one? I've called it quits with God. I can't believe in a good God after that. They're being honest at the very least, but I believe they began with a wrong understanding of God. It was not the biblical view, this view that God is there to take away all pain and give us only pleasure. That is not the true God. The picture of God in the Bible is not what we like to think he's like. The Bible calls that kind of thinking idolatry because an idol is an idea of God that you've made for yourself, that you've thought up, whether you make it in wood or stone or just in, in your mind. I could make up a God and say, that's the kind of God I think should be God. That's the kind of God I like. That's the kind of God I want to be God. But we can't manipulate God. God is what he really is. And we've got to find out what he really is before we make this kind of guess about his nature. So let's turn to the Bible. No wonder if we have this sentimental view of God, we have problems when natural disasters occur. That's why we say, why does he allow it? People suffering shouldn't be doing that if he's a loving God. So before we really get an answer to the question we're discussing, we need to ask, what is God really like? So we turn to the Bible, and I begin with what the Bible says about God's love. And here we have some surprises. The first thing that I want to mention, and you can check me up in your own Bible if you have one at home, check me out on everything I say. I don't want you to accept my opinion. I want you to find whether what I'm telling you is in your Bible. If it is, you can say, well, it's the Bible who told me. Don't you say David Paulson told me. I'm just sharing my understanding of the Bible, but I want you to check it all out. Go to your Bible, read it, study it, and find out if I'm telling you the truth about this, which I believe to be God's Word. And I want to make a little point here. You can prove anything you like from the Bible if you take little bits out of it. Take an odd verse here and an odd verse there. You can really prove anything you like. I'm talking about taking the Bible as a whole, the whole picture of God as it's presented in the whole Bible. And here's the first surprise for you. The Bible says very, very little about the love of God. It does actually mention it, but out of 35,000 verses in your Bible, less than 30 talk about his love. I can't work out the percentage. It's under 0.01%. That's tiny. There are whole books in the Bible. The majority of the books in the Bible never mention God's love at all. And the ones that do mention only one or two verses. Genesis says nothing about the love of God. Exodus has one verse. Leviticus, nothing. Numbers, nothing. Deuteronomy, two verses. Joshua, nothing. Judges, nothing. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, nothing. 1, 2 Kings, nothing. So I could go on. There are very few references to God's love in the Bible. Why then has the church made this its overall message? Well, I think it's because we have fallen for the temptation of telling people what they want to hear 
rather than telling them the truth. So the first surprise when we look at the Bible is that there's very little about the love of God. The second surprise is this, that in fact, it was never talked about in public. Whenever the Jews of the Old Testament talked about God's love, they talked to other Jews. They never talked to any others. The Jewish prophets said an awful lot about other nations, but they never said anything about God's love. It was a kind of in a quotation and in talk among Jews only. When we get to the New Testament, we find the same thing is true of Christians talking about the love of God. They never talked about the love of God to those who were not Christians. It was something they kept among themselves. Now that's a big surprise when the church today is talking about little else to everybody. But the Christians of the New Testament didn't. Neither Jesus nor his apostles ever preached the love of God in public. Take the book of Acts. That's a book about how the early church evangelized, how the church spread across the Mediterranean world, how they preached to Jew and Gentile, and many came in to faith. And yet not one verse in the book of Acts ever mentions the love of God. How striking that the early church grew and spread without ever mentioning the love of God. That's the second surprise. Why then did Jews and Christians only talk among themselves about the love of God so that every mention in Scripture is in private conversation and not in public preaching? The answer is very simple. Both Jews and Christians had been rescued from slavery by God. He had done something for them that he's not yet done for anybody else. And they were so grateful, knowing that they were totally undeserving of what he'd done, they now understood what incredible love God must have for them. In other words, only those who've been rescued from slavery by God, or in biblical language, those who've been redeemed, can understand what kind of love God has. That brings me to a third facts in our Bible, and that is that they were very careful to use special words for love when they were talking about God, different words to human love. Let me give you a little Greek lesson. I'm sorry to get technical, but the Greek language had three different kinds of words for love. We don't need to go into the technically, but they are eros, Filio and agape. And these were three different kinds of love, two of which most human beings understand. But the third, very few do. And the third word was rarely used in the ancient world because it was almost an unknown kind of love. And the Christians seized on that word to describe the love of God, to show how different it was from ours. Let me just run through the three words if you can picture this in your mind, eros, filio, agape. The first is primarily a word of the heart, a word of the emotions. It's a love of attraction. When you see somebody else and you are attracted to them, even to the point of lusting after them. And that is why that word is so often used of sexual love a love of attraction. Eyes meet across a room and people fall in love. It is an involuntary kind of love. You fall into it and fall out of it too. It's something you can't help. It's something that your heart takes over and you fall in love. You are attracted to someone, primarily a, a love of the heart. Then we come to filio. Now this is a love of affection. Not so much a love of attraction. There's a bit of attraction in it, but it's an affection and primarily a love of the mind. Two minds meet and find they have a lot in common and become friends. It is partly involuntarily, 
because you meet someone and, and you are tra you're attracted to their minds, you have some things in common, but it's also a voluntary love because you choose your friends and you can choose whom you go any further with or someone you drop. But it's a love of affection. Then we come to agape, which is a love of action. It is doing something good to help someone else. It is a love of the will, and it is entirely voluntary, something that you choose to do. When you meet someone in need, you can ignore the need, or you can choose to do something to help them. That's the kind of love that God has. That's agape love. To illustrate, when somebody came to Jesus one day and said, how can I love my neighbor? What's loving your neighbor? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. A Jew had fallen among thieves and been beaten up. He'd been mugged and was lying, bleeding in the middle of the road. A priest came walking by and walked, him pa walked past him. Another walked past him. But as a Samaritan, who normally didn't like the Jews at all and the Jews didn't like him, there was no love of attraction for a bleeding Jew lying in the middle of the road in the heart of a Samaritan. There was no love of affection in that Jewish minds and Samaritan minds were so different in their thinking there was no mutual affection. They disliked each other. But the Samaritan went and did something good to meet that man's need. That's what Jesus calls love. It's not a love of attraction or a love of affection that you like someone. It's not lusting after someone or liking someone. It is doing something to help them. That's practical love, love in action. And the other two words are never used. Now, you know, not far from me in this studio is Piccadilly Circus. And there's a statue in the middle of that circus. Do you know what it's called? Don't tell me Eros. That's not its name. It's been called that because people looking not too closely at the figure on the statue think it's Cupid with his bow and arrow. And, uh, of course, they call it Eros, the love or even lust of attraction, particularly sexual. And, of course, what goes on around Piccadilly Circus and Soho nearby really fits that. But that statue has nothing to do with Eros, that kind of love. It's an agape statue. It was erected to a man called Anthony Ashley Cooper, better known as Lord Shaftesbury, who spent his whole life helping the poor, helping to improve working conditions in factories and coal mines, helping to relieve need. And he was greatly admired, so much so that uh, you'll find his name in Westminster Abbey. And he was admired by the whole country. His funeral was attended by so many distinguished people because they recognized this man was love in action. He did so much good for social welfare all his life. And he'd been born in the aristocracy into a rich family. But he spent his life for the poor, for the underdog, for the working class. And so they put up the statue, and if you go and read the inscription on the statue, you'll find anything but eros and anything but filio, but you'll find a lot of agape. This man expressed the kind of love that God has. So here are the surprises in the Bible about God's love. It's hardly ever mentioned. It's only mentioned among those who have experienced God's action in redeeming and rescuing them from slavery, either in Egypt or slavery to sin, which is far worse slavery, and most of us are in it. Those who have experienced forgiveness, to put it in a nutshell, are those who understand God's love. The one thing the Bible never says is God loves everybody. I challenge you to find a single statement in the Bible that God loves everybody. But the church has been teaching this. No wonder we get such comeback questions as why does God allow suffering or why, how can a loving God ever send anybody to hell? We've invited these questions. We've created the problem by telling people that God is all loving and loves everybody. 
This is not the Bible. In fact, the Bible says many things about God that really are not very loving at all. For example, it says he's very patient with people and he's slow to anger, but he can get very angry with people. And I tell you, when God gets very angry with some, they better get out of his way. It would be better if they'd never been born. My New Testament says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Then take another contrast. God is delighted with some people, especially when they, when they are good, but he gets disgusted with other people and his disgust is written into this book. It's called an abomination to him. God can get disgusted with people. Tell you one thing he gets disgusted with, when we confuse male and female. He made us to be different. Different roles, different responsibilities, even different dress and different hairstyles were God's will. And when we confuse all that and men behave like women and women behave like men and men dress like women and women dress like men and men's hairdo looks like women's hairdo and women's hairdo looks like men's hairdo. And when, yes, when men have sex with men and women with women, we are going right against God's provision of the most beautiful thing in our lives, sex. And when God made sex, he said, now that's very good. That's my masterpiece. Male and female, he made us. And we're messing up his creation and God gets disgusted with us for doing this. Take another contrast. It says that God blesses people and that he curses people. A God who blesses and curses, is this loving to curse people? Not in the sentimental mode it isn't. Now, let's just go back to the Holocaust for a moment. The amazing thing is that if you read one chapter in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, when God tells the people of Israel, the Jews, I will bless you if you live my way, but I will curse you if you don't. And that is why the Jewish people have been more blessed and more cursed than any other. And when you read Deuteronomy 28, you are reading a prediction of what happened to the Jews in Germany. It's not very popular to say that. I've said it in a synagogue and aroused the anger of many Jewish people. I love the Jewish people, but uh, they find it very difficult to accept that God curses them as well as blesses them. But it's come true in my lifetime because I was alive when the Holocaust happened. And like many, I said, where is God in all this? But he was there and he said this would happen to them, that the terror of it would happen, that they would be exposed to the hatred of other nations. And it's all come true. So God is patient, but he can get very angry. God loves and he hates. Do you know that there are the same number of verses in the Bible about God's hate as about God's love? And the answer is about 30. There are about 30 references to the love of God and 30 references to his hate. And the surprising thing is this. You would expect that what he would hate would be evil. But there is no such thing as evil. Evil only exists in evil people. And out of 30 references to God's hate, 10 or one third refer to his hatred of evil, but two thirds specifically state that he hates wicked people. I wonder if you've heard the cliche, God hates sin but loves a sinner. That's not biblical. He hates sinners too if they cling to their sin and will not be separated or rescued from it. So God hates people as well as loves people. And therefore, finally, God destroys people as well as heals them. He's a God who can heal us and is a, he's a God who can kill us. And he has killed many, many people according to this book. But the interesting thing is 
he always has a good reason for killing. Before I say more about that, let's just look at this apparent contradiction. God is patient, slow to anger, but he can get very angry. God blesses and he curses. God loves and he hates. God heals and he kills. The Bible gives a very balanced picture of those two sides of God's character. Does that mean that God is good and bad at the same time? Does it mean he's moody and you've got to catch him in a good mood when you pray to him? Does it mean he's schizophrenic? No. What is it that binds these two sides of his activity together in perfect harmony and consistency? You can't say love does because many of those things are very unloving in our understanding of love. But what binds them together? And the answer is everything can be explained provided God is good. But how good is God? We can't imagine because actually you and I have probably never met a good person. We've met people who are a mixture of good and bad, but no one is good like God. In fact, one day someone came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus came back like lightning and said, why did you call me good? No one is good but God. You see, why does God hate? Why does he kill? Why does he curse? Because he's so good. That doesn't make sense to us because we, we, we don't experience perfect goodness and therefore it's way above our thinking. But God is so good that he has to hate evil. He's so good that he has to curse people who are not good. He's so good that he has to destroy people who are totally wicked. And in fact, that explains many of the incidents in the Bible. Take Noah's flood, for example. God became less and less patient with the human race. And the human race began to get worse and worse. Two things were happening. First of all, perverted sex. And secondly, violence filled the earth. And God, in the saddest verse in the Bible, said, I regretted that I had made man. That must be the saddest verse in the Bible, that God regretted. I'm sure you can understand that when a parent, I've heard parents say, we wish we'd never had the children. When kids are so rebellious and so anti their parents, we wish we'd never had them. God wished that once. He regretted that he had made man. Well, so he resolved to destroy them and he destroyed all that generation was an awful thing, but God was cleaning up his earth of those who were polluting it morally. He'd created a good earth, put good people on it, but given them the freedom to become bad people, and they'd done it. And so he reached the end of his patience. He said, I'm not going to go on struggling with them. And one thing he said, I can see into their minds and everything I see is horrible. Their thoughts are only evil continually. They're constantly thinking up bad things. And so there was one family, however, one good family, at least one good man, and his wife and three sons and three daughters-in-law, and they were good people. And God said, I'll save that family because they're good, but I have to destroy the others because I'm so good that I cannot tolerate their badness. The same was true when the Israelites came into Canaan. People say, God is guilty of ethnic cleansing. He told the Israelites to kill all the Canaanites. But we are told that God had waited 300 years until the Canaanites were so wicked that they did not deserve to live. In other words, it's because God is so good. But the word good is uh, losing its meaning. We talk about a good dog, a good holiday, a good meal, good weather. And what we mean is it gives us pleasure. 
But the word good really should only be used of God because he's the only really good person in the entire universe. And that's why he has to deal with evil. So the word good is really not very helpful to use of God. Unfortunately, the Bible uses another special word. It's in the English dictionary, but I never hear people use it. It's the word righteous. God is righteous. And that word means that everything he does is right. He is perfectly, absolutely just and fair. You cannot bribe him. You cannot corrupt him. You cannot manipulate him. He will always do what is absolutely right and just. It's good to have a God like that, isn't it? Or is it? The negative side of his righteousness means that he cannot ever do anything wrong. He cannot tell a lie. He cannot break a promise. He cannot tell a dirty joke. There are so many things God can't do, and that qualifies his power because he can't use that power in a bad way. It's against his whole nature. So here we have a picture in the Bible of a righteous God who will therefore always deal righteously with us. And he must therefore, according to his righteous nature, always punish evil. He would be less than good, less than righteousness, righteous if he overlooked bad, if he never punished evil. He's got to do it. He is so good that he will not let anyone get away with bad things. Again, I think that's good news. It means we have a universe which is moral, that nobody will get away with anything. Now, I know that crime pays now, that two-thirds of crime will not be detected by the police and therefore not punished in the courts. And many criminals think they've got away with it. Listen, God is righteous. Nobody will ever get away with anything. Sin, vice, and crime all have to be paid for because this universe is in the hands of a righteous God. Well, now, let's uh, begin to draw to a conclusion. There are two things I could say about God which may cause you to think deeply, but here's the first. A righteous God cannot forgive, or he's less than righteous. He must deal with bad things. He must punish them and one day banish them. And I can tell you this, that God has decided to do that. He has already set a day in his diary when he will call every human being to account and will punish those who've done bad things and reward those who've done good things. Now, how does that grab you? Funny thing is, it's a human weakness that we always think it's somebody else who's bad, that other people are the cause of all the problems in the world and all the trouble. People say to me, why doesn't God destroy all the bad people now? Why doesn't he get on with it and get rid of all the evil people in the world? And there's an assumption behind that that I find amusing virtually saying, and then the rest of us can live happy, safe, comfortable lives. But I tell you this solemnly, that if God did it now and destroyed everybody who's making this world a worse place than it is, there wouldn't be anybody left. You'd have no speaker on this program, and nobody would be listening to it, because if God had dealt with me as I deserve, I wouldn't be living. And it's not because I'm terribly bad but I know I'm polluting his world. So there's the first thing I want to say in conclusion. God, being righteous, cannot forgive sin. Unless, unless it's been paid for already. Unless the penalty for being bad has already been taken by someone else. Now, that begins to open up a bit of understanding, I hope, for you. If God said to you and to me, 
well, boys will be boys, I'll let you off this time, try not to do it again. That would be immoral. That would be unrighteous. It would be unfair. It would be unjust. A righteous God could not say that to me. What he could say to me is this. I'll forgive you because somebody else has already paid the penalty. I can only let you off because somebody else did. And the other thing I want to say in conclusion is this. A righteous God cannot punish the innocent, only the guilty. And that raises the whole question of what do we really deserve? Do I deserve to live or to die? Do any of us deserve to die? Do any of us deserve to live? These are the questions I want to deal with next time. But again, this thought opens up this thought. If God punishes the guilty, why did his only son die a violent and premature death? A violent and premature death is not deserved by an innocent victim. And if ever there was an innocent person, it was Jesus. Even his enemies admitted they couldn't find anything wrong. And yet God submitted him to a violent and premature death. I want to leave you with those two thoughts. That God, if he's righteous, cannot forgive until the penalty has been paid. And that God should punish the guilty, not the innocent. And yet he punished his only natural son with a violent and premature death. That's going to be a starting off point for our next talk, which is on Monday, January the 31st at 9 p.m. Do tune in and listen to my last talk on this crucial subject. Thank you for listening.